and a very good evening to all the participants. It is my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Shurendranath College to the second day of this international webinar, COVID-19 through the eyes of young researchers organized under the DBT Star College Strengthening Scheme of Government of India. Now I would like to welcome our Honorable Principal Sir, Dr. Indronil Kaur, to please inaugurate the session and deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Principal Sir. Thank you, Vaishali. A very good evening to ladies and gentlemen. COVID-19 and, COVID and its impact is being felt by one and all. Though the number of cases per day has been increasing regularly, but the unlock phase also has resumed. It is almost assured that there is no respite from this infection until we can enhance our immunity against this dreaded virus or till a new vaccine comes to our rescue by selectively enhancing our immunity. Thus, the entire world is waiting eagerly for the vaccine. It is not the vaccine alone, but after a candidate vaccine is known, the production should also match so that the entire world population can be covered. More than 150 laboratories are engaged in the search of a candidate vaccine. Some are very close to the trial. Others are in various stages. In our country, one company in collaboration with ICMR, though if a fairly a good number of laboratories were engaged in this in various, uh, in various capacities, they were also engaged in the search for a candidate vaccine. But a company has come out with the, in collaboration with ICMR and they're very close to the vaccine. The trial is underway in various parts of this country, and it is also assumed that 15 August may be the declaration day as per the ICMR for the vaccine to be announced. But still, we have to keep our fingers crossed because the, it is not only the vaccine, naming a vaccine or finding a candidate vaccine, but it is the production of that vaccine and we have to also find out that the vaccine is really useful to our population or not. There are several questions to be answered. Yesterday, Amarshi was really wonderful in explaining various points of this, various issues relating to COVID-19. So today we have another energetic girl from USA who is a research Caller. He is actually facing the situation there and will definitely understand a lot from her. We have Srijoni Das from USA to give us a, her feeling about the, her, her understanding about the, the production of a vaccine or finding of a candidate vaccine and thereby the production to match with it. I think. With this, I will request Vaishali to introduce the speaker, and then we should we should wait for Prajani to tell us the latest about the vaccine. Over to you, Vaishali. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Principal Sir. Our speaker for this session is Miss Srijoni Dash, a young researcher with hands-on experience of working with RNA viruses. Srijani completed her integrated MSc from the Department of Biotechnology, St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. Then she joined the Immunology, Pathology, and Infectious Disease Program of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, USA. And presently, she is pursuing her PhD over there. Today, 
Srijani will be speaking on two very important aspects of COVID-19. The present scenario of vaccine development and why elderly people are more susceptible to COVID. I hope her presentation will enlighten all of us. Over to you, Srijani. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, you are perfectly audible, Srijoni. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Shurendranath College Principal Sir and the organizing committee for this wonderful opportunity. I had the privilege of being an audience in Dr. Omar Shimukherjee's presentation yesterday and observed that due to time constraints, some questions in the chat box had remained unanswered. Hence, I have tried to integrate some of those into my presentation today and hence apologize if I appear to sway away from the topic of discussion at certain instances. So without further ado, I will begin my presentation. Coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 or the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. It belongs to the family of coronaviruses, the other members being SARS-CoV-1, which led to the outbreak in Guangdong, China in 2003, and the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, that is MERS-CoV, which led to the outbreak in Saudi Arabia in 2012. Interestingly, the other four members, 29E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1, are causative agents for common cold and flu-like symptoms, which we have every day. Now, the members of this family get their name from the Latin word corona, which roughly translates as crown or halo. When we view a coronavirus through a transmission electron microscope, it resembles the halo of a sun, as you can see in this picture. This is attributed to the surface spike protein that it uses to bind to ACE2 receptor on the human cell surface. Upon binding, it internalizes and uncoats, revealing its positive sense single-stranded RNA genome, which then makes proteins and more genetic material. These then arrange to form new viruses, which then bud out of the cell. Now that we know the life cycle of this virus, let us view the approaches to preventing and treating COVID-19. So the very first approach is to prevent the virus from entering the cell. How? by preventing the spike protein from interacting with the ACE2 receptor. And this is the predominant prevention approach for vaccines, which I will further elaborate later. The other way is to stop the viral life cycle at any one of the steps using antiretroviral drugs, such as remdesivir and lopavirin. Lastly, we can prevent the reaction of the host to the effects of the virus. We know that SARS-CoV-2, or we have heard, causes cytokine storm, inflammation, hence blocks the airway. Any drug which can decrease these effects would qualify as a drug which can prevent host reactions to virus. The very highly publicized hydroxychloroquine is an immunosuppressant and is hence thought to decrease the cytokine storm and would fall under this category. Now, I would like to introduce a very relevant term called drug repurposing. I am currently working on HIV medication and we have started a BSL-3 in which we are working on 
HIV drug repurposing to treat coronavirus. So what is drug repurposing? It is basically giving an existing drug a new purpose in another disease. So what happens in pandemic situations like now? A virus is seen, which is killing everybody. We need a medicine fast, but we have to study many things of the virus life cycle to arrive at that conclusion. So what do we do? Number one, we go through the pre-existing drugs of viruses which belong to the same family. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it would be SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. And medicines like hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir came into the equation because they had been previously seen to have some efficacy in containing MERS and SARS-CoV-1. Then we can take a different approach. We would then see viruses which have similar genetic material to SARS-CoV-1. HIV happens to be one such virus, though it is a retrovirus, but still it has single-stranded positively sensed RNA. And from that, we have got lopanivir, which can be used to fight the efficacies of SARS-CoV-1. One thing to be kept in mind is that the drug, whichever we are trying to repurpose, should have been in use for a number of years and the safety and efficacy should be known before using such a drug. It should be FDA and CDC approved. So we are hearing various many stories every single day about this virus, uh, this antivirus compound, this vaccine. So how do we know that the stories we are hearing are true, they're authentic or not? So Millikan Institute has publicized a very nice COVID-19 tracker where you can see exactly how many treatment regimens or treatment modules there are and how many vaccines are in development. If you go to the vaccines, they provide a very comprehensive picture about the product description, the people who are developing it, and which stage of clinical trial they are currently a part of. Now the question arises, why am I stressing on vaccines and not antiretrovirals? That is because even though we are repurposing drugs, they have controversial results and limited efficacies. Another problem is resistance. Since we are using drugs which are normally used for some other disease, if that particular bacteria or virus is prone to mutation, then after you use the drug to treat this particular disease, if you were ever to get infected by the disease which was the mother drug, a mother disease of the drug you had repurposed, then perhaps that drug would not work to its full potential because you have already developed resistance against it. And another point is that vaccines are generally safer and prevention is obviously better than cure. Vaccine is one of the greatest success stories in global health. And it has controlled more than 20 life-threatening diseases. And as we all know, it has prevented deadly diseases like polio and eradicated diseases like smallpox. So the next question arises, what is a vaccine? But before that, let's first address what a vaccine does. So a vaccine elicits an effective and potent immune response through the production 
of high blood levels of antibodies. And these antibodies should be potent enough to neutralize, or in other words, prevent subsequent infection of that bacteria or virus we are making the vaccine against. Therefore, anything which can produce these effective neutralizing, um, preventing antibodies can qualify as vaccine targets. So what are the developmental stages for vaccine? The first stage is called the exploratory stage. The second is the preclinical stage. Then comes the clinical development. Then is the regulation, the review, the approval. Then is the manufacturing. And finally, quality control. So very first stage or preclinical we have to identify the antigen. What is that? It is the substance which will produce the effective antibodies in the body. After we identify that antigen, we will then test it out in cells. If it tests well, we then go to a higher animal, we go through mice, then rats, then um, non-human primate models. And by doing this, we find the safety dosage and the method of administration. Many of the vaccines in development often do not make it through these preclinical stages. And preclinical stages often last from one to two years. After the preclinical stage, will come the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. Each of these trials take from around two to three years to complete. And after each phase is complete, will the vaccine be approved for the next phase? So the first most important criteria for phase one is safety screening. Is the vaccine safe? If it is so, then we take the vaccine to the phase two. Phase one, we do try to determine if the vaccine is effective or not, but due to the small sample size, the statistical values may not be that significant. So in the phase two and phase three clinical trials, we try to understand the efficacy of the vaccine along with the safety. And by the end of all three clinical trials, we ask only one question. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? If so, it is approved and sent for manufacture. Now, after the manufacturing is done and we have a large amount of vaccine to be distributed on a global scale, the efficacies of this vaccine will constantly still be monitored through FDA and CDC, through public feedback, through various studies ongoing in the laboratories. And let me remind you, in phase one, phase two, phase three, we try to determine the efficacy. But once it has been licensed, we try to determine the effectiveness, meaning we try to see how much the vaccine is being successful in decreasing the viral load in a global scale. And this entire licensing procedure takes from 10 to 15 years. But COVID-19 has revolutionized this timeline and shrunk it to a matter of months. As seen in the Millikan site, there are 179 vaccine candidates in development. This never before global initiative and partnership is utilizing a diverse array of vaccine development platforms, some of which have never been used in a licensed vaccine till date. Now, one thing I would like to point out here is that 
so much of information may look daunting. But remember, there needs to be something in a vaccine which is effective in producing a potent antibody that can prevent infection from occurring. And that something from SARS-CoV-2 happens to be the spike protein. So this spike protein can be introduced in whichever way, as long as it elicits a potent antibody reaction, it can be used as a vaccine candidate. So one such way of introducing it is as the complete virus, but it has to be weakened or inactivated. Otherwise, the person being vaccinated will contract SARS-CoV-2. So a weakened or inactivated virus would still contain the spike protein on its envelope, but it should not be inactivated in such a way that the structure of the spike protein changes. It can also be introduced as protein subunits. How? By just pulling off the spike proteins from the virus coat. Another way is to use a dummy virus or a virus-like particle in which instead of a real SARS-CoV-2 virus, you have a mimic of that with the spike proteins on its surface. Another way is to introduce it through genetically engineered non-pathogenic viruses. That is in a replication or a replication uh, active viral vector or a non-replicating viral vector. What is done is that the genetic material of these non-pathogenic genetically engineered viruses has the sequence for the spike protein, which is then injected into the body. On entering it, it will then start producing these spike proteins, which will elicit the antibody response. Nucleic acid vaccines are of DNA or RNA type. Also the same concept, you have the spike protein either in a DNA or in an RNA. In an RNA, it is enclosed in a nanolipid coat and it is injected into the body where it will translate, produce the spike protein, which will elicit the, the, the antibody production. The other one is the DNA in which you have the sequence of the spike protein, which when injected will transcribe and translate to produce your spike protein. Now, we move into the forerunners of vaccine development. The leading case for vaccine development is Shadox-1. It is a non-replicating viral vector developed by the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca. And the same group has already developed vaccines against MERS, influenza, chikungunya, and Zika. So they are considered as a very trial and tested group. And the second runner up is, the first runner up is the adenovirus type five vector developed by CanSino Biogenics, which also utilizes the same platform of non-replicating viral vectors. And they have also made a vaccine for Ebola. If we go back, the red box shows the non-replicating viral vector, as I had previously mentioned, which use non-pathogenic viruses, which are genetically engineered, which encode for the spike protein. Going back, the third in line is the lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA developed by Moderna and NIAD. And the fourth in line is the DNA plasmid vaccine with electroporation developed by Inovio Pharmaceuticals. An interesting thing to note here is that this platform has never been used before for any licensed vaccine. And this is the mechanism, as you can see the DNA and the RNA. The RNA is for the LN, 
the RNA vaccine is made by Moderna and the DNA vaccine is made by Inovio. Another very important thing to note here is I had mentioned that you can go for one phase of clinical trial to the next only after getting the results from the previous clinical trial and it takes one to two years. But if we consider Shadox one, we can see that firstly, the phases are not well-defined. They have started a phase one, phase two together, a phase two, B three together. And phase one slash two clinical trial had begun on April 23rd, 2020. It was one of the very first vaccines to be developed. And the clinical trial is expected to yield results in May 2021, that is next year. But already the phase 2B slash 3 clinical trial began enrollment in May 2020, and the phase 3 clinical trial began in UK in May 2020, and they expect the results next year in July. And they are going to begin another phase 3 clinical trial in the United States this August. Hence, what are they trying to do? What happens if one of the results turn out to be negative? Then the entire clinical trials, all phases which have yet not completed will be forfeited. We have already learned that they are developing 179 vaccine candidates. And this requires tremendous amount of money with global efforts worldwide millions and millions of dollars. Normally, you would have one vaccine development, uh, monitor it for a few years. If it doesn't work, the next. But given the present scenario, it is not feasible to have one after the other. So the world economies have decided to start simultaneous clinical trials of all the lead candidate vaccines present and whichever works will be enough to save the economy, humanity, and all the socioeconomic burdens that might be a problem of testing so many vaccines. A very interesting uh, thing to note about these vaccine forerunners is that if you have been tracking vaccine development, the scenario is changing almost every month. If you see here, in 18th February, 2020, Shadox was way below. And then in 18th June, 2020, it shot up and became the forerunner and it has maintained its status till now. So this very dynamic shifting nature is a very interesting thing you might want to track from now on. And if this phase three clinical trial of Shadox succeeds, then we should have a vaccine by next year. Are we hopeful? Yes, we are. Because you have to understand that each of these companies are using the very best platform that they have trialed and tested for other vaccine developments. And they are doing their best to come up with a vaccine which will be safe and efficacious, but the rest will be determined after it is licensed and used. Can all of them fail? Probably not, because everybody is working their best to find the best way to move forward. And as we saw, they are not using the same platform. When you are attacking a tiger in a jungle, in all the ways humanly possible. One has gone with a shotgun, the other has gone with a bow and arrow, the other has gone with a trap. You will eventually catch it because you are using a number of different methods to catch the very same target. Now we come to the concept of herd immunity, which is the hallmark of what a vaccine is supposed So what happens in herd immunity? The blue 
people represent non-immunized but healthy adults. The yellow represent immunized and healthy adults and the red represent non-immunized, sick and contagious adults. So when a sick person is beside many healthy people, everybody gets sick. But in the case of immunization, it can prevent the spread to a certain extent. But if a lot of people are immunized, then the chain will break before it can reach more non-immunized individuals. If you see in this video, the blue dots represent the non-immunized population, the yellow represent the immunized population, and there is a black dot in the middle, which is a sick individual. Depending on the vaccination of the entire population, the spread will also vary. This red line represents spread. As we can see, with more and more vaccination, lesser and lesser people who are not immunized will not be susceptible to that disease. A very important part to note about herd immunity is that we should target those people who are more likely than not to get infected, such as the elderly people and the very young people who have a lesser strong immune system than most healthy adults. Now I will talk about the susceptibility of elderly people to COVID-19. COVID-19 from a gerontological perspective is seen as a disease of the elderly people. Why is that? Because it has been seen that with increase in age, the number of death rate has increased exponentially. Thus, there must be some factor why COVID-19 is affecting the elderly more than the general population. Before we go into that topic, I would like to introduce the concept of cytokine storm. So what happens in the cells of our body is that when apoptosis occurs, a cell dies. And when a cell dies, the cells beside those cells will release pro-inflammatory cytokines. Why? Because they are trying to alert the other leukocytes in the body that here there has been a death. Please come and remove the debris of the dead cells. So they will come, they will remove the debris and they will release anti-inflammatory cytokines which will again tilt the balance to a neutral. But what happens in the case of COVID-19? We know that COVID-19 infects our lungs. More specifically, it infects the alveoli of our lungs. The alveoli are those tiny sacs in the lungs through which the actual diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide take place and hence it absorbs the oxygen we require to breathe. So over there, the cells infect, uh, the virus infects, they replicate in the cells, they lyse the cells, and there is dead particles of cells all around. Then the new virions go out, infect the next cells and the next cells, and the cells constantly keep dying and the cells beside those constantly keep releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines. In response to those pro-inflammatory cytokines, newer leukocytes come in and they can also sense the virus. They release more pro-inflammatory cytokines as a response to a viral attack. Because you have to understand that these leukocytes would normally try to get rid of these virus through this native mechanism. So they will release more pro-inflammatory cytokines. These will cause, call more leukocytes and more leukocytes 
and more leukocytes. And what happens is that due to this increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, the blood flow to that area will keep on increasing so as to allow these new leukocytes to come to the site of action to clear out the dead cells. This creates an extremely high cytokine response, which is not able to be balanced by anti-inflammatory cytokines, leading to fluid-rich filling of the alveoli through which no oxygen diffusion occurs, and we choke and cannot breathe in SARS-CoV-2, leading to severe acute respiratory syndrome. One point which is very important is inflammation is the body's first natural defense against foreign pathogens, damaged and dying cells. Why did I stress on damaged and dying cells? Because in the elderly population, cellular senescence is a very important factor. Due to certain reasons, like genomic instability, then decrease in telomere size, then decrease in the clearing efficiency, more and more cells die in the elderly people and more and more cells are not effectively cleared. What this causes is an increase in the basal inflammation. As we had already led that dead cells and dying cells increase the inflammation of the body. Now, cellular senescence will then cause inflammaging and immunosenescence. So what is inflammaging? It is basically the inflammation, the basal level inflammation that occurs due to aging. Why does it occur due to aging? Because as we already mentioned, there is cellular senescence and the body cannot get rid, cannot effectively get rid of the dead cells. So this increases, it, this already tilts that balance towards the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it takes very little viral um, cytokine release to tilt the balance more to cause a cytokine storm. Another important factor is immunosenescence. As we already know, with age, the number of cells in the body die and also the leukocytes, the white blood cells also die. The CD4 plus cells, the CD8 plus cells, all these cells which are supposed to give a potent immune reaction against the body will also die. Thus, this will also increase the probability of a cytokine storm. In summary, cellular senescence will cause more and more cell death and less and less clearing of those del debris, which will increase inflammation, which is a result of aging. And this will also decrease the amount of immune cells in the body and Thus, a person will not be, an elderly person will not be able to number one, fight against an invading pathogen as well as they would have been able to when they were young. And number two, due to the decrease in the immune cells, they will neither be able to surmount such an effective antibody response against the vaccines that we develop. Thus, it is very, very important to develop a vaccine that works as effectively in the normal population as it works in the elderly population. So I would take this opportunity to thank the frontline workers and my kind audience for hearing this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Srijoni, for your thought-provoking presentation. The present scenario of vaccine development was very meticulously and lucidly explained by you. 
and you have also very nicely highlighted the reasons behind the susceptibility of the elderly people to covid thank you again it was a pleasure to have you as our speaker a very important announcement for the participants the feedback link will be displayed in the chat box as well as in the college website i request all the participants to kindly fill up the feedback form and submit the same to get the e certificate now we would like to start with the question answer session uh, srijoni are you ready for the question answer session yes i am okay okay srijoni Yes, I'm the uh, I'm the principal to the Sonal College, Dr. Indranil Kaur. What happened yes. is today you made me a student. I am really thankful the way you explained the intricacies of this development of vaccine was really wonderful. And I again I I should thank you that again you have made me realize that I am still a student of science. Wonderful. So. with this i think we are, we should understand that how absorbing was your lecture and how you took us by a strong you could made us make us feel that we are actually the students of science very good thank you very much so my question is see you talk, you spoke about the hard immunity if no vaccine comes into existence or we just close our eyes for towards vaccine how many how much of the population what the percentage of the population should get infected to grow that herd immunity what will be the cost of that to the population or the cost to the human kind thank you i will try to explain this as much as possible Please. so depending on the immune status of an individual they will or will not be able to surmount an effective immune response enough to build now we already know that the very elderly are susceptible in most cases without a vaccine so they will succumb to the infection and depending on their social economic stand and the other drug in bog they will either survive or die there are the other people who are younger and have a better they will probably be able to produce antibodies to save themselves from the vac uh, the virus so given the scenario that the virus is not once infected and they have a high enough antibody type from the next line of the very same strain of virus so to answer your question i would say that depending on the immune status because right now we have cases where very young people have also died not in elderly so we cannot just differentiate it on age it has to be immune status of a particular person so the exact statistic may not be so well economic conditions the immune status they will either survive or perish and then when the entire population has been infected with the virus you will get herd immunity but then again if the virus were to mutate there would be another line of selection pressure in survival of the fittest according to darwin So it was a wonderfully explained, and it will be a really a huge cost to the entire world population if we were just wait for a hard immunity to arise. 
and instead of vaccine coming in and in our rescue. Thank you very much. So I wish you all the best for this. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Sir. Thank you, Srijani. Now, the question number two. Srijani, this is Koushik Lahiri. Let us first congratulate you and thank you for the excellent presentation and the explanation you have done for the vaccination, initial for the drug, uh, for the viruses, and lately for the elderly. All those explanations. Thank you so much. And I am provoked to ask you in this uh, system of, uh, in the situation where we are in right now. So for the past hundred years, probably this is the first time you're facing such type of pandemic through the world. And uh, how many types of such type of deadly threatening viruses are there? Is it X to the power N? And if it is X to the power N, then how many vaccines should the humankind in future be ready to be prepared to take on? Uh, is it uh, 365 days each day is a vaccine or there might be a generalized vaccine of, for those viruses? Thank you for the question. It's a very thought-provoking question. For antibody, like the final goal of a vaccine, is to produce an antibody against a particular antigen which is specific for the virus. And as we know, antibody antigen interactions are specific to picomolar level. Even one amino acid mutation now stop one antibody from binding to an antigen. That is the reason why changing strains and mutation make a vaccine redundant. In that context, sadly to say, I would think that for every single virus, there has to be a different vaccine unless and until there is a very, very, very faint chance that two viruses would be so very similar to each other. As I can say, when the first um, patients of coronavirus came in to our Nebraska Biocontainment Unit, um, Nebraska Biocontainment Unit is one of the most famous biocontainment units in the world because it effectively treated Ebola. So this time when the virus outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 happened, they transported many patients all over the United States to the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. And very large research companies came to take the serum from these uh, patients. What they tried to do is they tried to extract the antibodies from these SARS CoV 2 patients and try and test them in SARS CoV 1 and Mars to see if these antibodies can actually neutralize them as well. If that does happen, then in the reverse process, SARS CoV 2 and Mars antibodies can be used to neutralize SARS. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 and Mars antibodies can be used to neutralize SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. But they saw that no, none of these antibodies can neutralize each other. So they come to the very same family, they are not cross-reactive. Hence, I would conclude that you are right. For every single virus that comes along, we will perhaps have to make a new virus every time and this ongoing work war will keep continuing thank you Sanjay. thank you for the wonderful explanation thank you kale now next i have some questions from the chat box uh, question number three would be there is a claim that icmr and bharat biotech have uh, jointly developed a vaccine against COVID-19. 
and uh, it will be announced by the pm on 15th august so uh, srijoni what is your comment on it from what i have heard from yesterday is that they have finished the pre clinical trials and okay. they are going to initiate the phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 clinical trial from the 7th of july okay and they are proposing to get the vaccine ready on the 15th of august that's our independence day okay. now firstly as i mentioned any vaccine development takes from 10 to 15 years to see the effectiveness the efficacy in order to use it as a vaccine for general use covid-19 has changed this paradigm and they have shrunk that to a number of months because as you saw if chadox is to come into the market they yes. have begun in april 23rd 2020 if it is to come then it would be late the next year that would be one and a half years approximately but this icmr vaccine is supposed to conclude phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 clinical trials in a matter of weeks i would like to ask the viewers how much they think this is rational and how safe would such a vaccine be which is rushed to the point of um non scientificness so okay. according to me okay. perhaps mm-hmm. it may not yield the desired results thank you okay thank you for the wonderful explanation i hope the person that asked it has got his uh, answer the next question question number 4 would be uh you said that uh, the vaccines do not work well for the elderly people so can there be any way out to uh, make it work for the elderly people also of course thank you so much for the question okay. in yeah. the elderly people <clears throat> the problem is that the amount of inoculum is not enough to surmount an effective reaction the effective production of antibodies very lucidly speaking it is like you are standing on the road waiting for a taxi mm. and in a 1 km radius you have 10 taxis your probability of finding a taxi is very high that is the situation in a normal person in a normal healthy uh in a healthy individual who is uh not too old in a very old person that 1 km radius there would be two taxis which make getting a taxi much much more difficult so what do you do from a vaccine standpoint you use an adjuvant what does an adjuvant an adjuvant is combined with that antigen and it stays in the blood for a longer period of time and what this does is that it makes it number one more visible to an antigen presenting cell that would need to eat it up just like if you would have a neon sign popping on top of your head declaring that you want a taxi it would be easier for the two taxis in the 1 km radius to locate you just like that an adjuvant would make that antigen more visible and easier to gobble up and produce an effective antibody response there are laboratories which are working to specifically check the efficacy and the effectiveness of a vaccine in the elderly population by trying and testing these adjuvants on specific um elderly population and they're trying it on elderly pop- uh, blood from elderly population in the phase 
uh, the preclinical trials and they wish to check the effectiveness of that vaccine on elderly population so as to make sure that whatever vaccine comes out, the most affected people are definitely given a ray of hope. Okay. Okay, thank you, Srijani. The next question would be, um, how long do you think the COVID-19 vaccine will confer immunity? Okay, thank you for the very in important question. So yeah. we have seen that from our youth, we are given a vaccination schedule. There are certain vaccines which are given only once, which surmount a huge antibody response and the effect of the, and the levels of antibodies in the blood stay at a very high level. Whereas there are other vaccines which require booster doses because after a point of time, the antibody titer starts waning. Now this COVID-19 vaccine, we don't have that yet, but when we do get it, we will start getting data which will tell us how effective it is in surmounting an immune reaction, how much, how high antibody titers it can maintain for how long, and at what frequency we need to be given a booster dose. Another point to be considered here is that what happens when the virus mutates? If a virus mutates and the vaccine which has been developed is ineffective for that particular virus, new strain of that virus, then we would again have to make another COVID-19 vaccine, which is very feasible. Because as you noticed, there are 179 vaccine um, uh, developing strategies going on right now. So since the entire world is already armed and ready to fight against COVID-19, they have also armed and is ready to fight against any other bacterial or viral disease because they have already made this um, platform. So it would not take too much time to change uh, a few sequences here and there to make another potential va uh, vaccine to fight the next wave of coronavirus if it were to come. Okay, fine. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, we'll be able to take one more last question. Uh, and the last question would be, uh, is it wise uh, to take immunosuppressors at uh, this time of uh, COVID-19? Very nice question. Uh, well, uh, firstly, if you are well, of course, you will not take an immunosuppressive. I would like to um, briefly elucidate this further. So okay. number one, the body's immunity is well equipped to fight against bacterial and viral diseases. We have pattern recognition receptors, which are specifically trained to find bacteria and virus. They then elicit pro-inflammatory cytokines, which call in more uh, leukocytes and white blood cells to fight that infection. The moment you take an immunosuppressor, it is not going to allow your body to fight the viral infection. And another thing that is a problem with immunosuppressor is that you are compromising your immune system. You are trying to save yourself from SARS-CoV-2. You will die of pneumonia from a bacterial infection because bacteria are going to wait for your immune system to go down. So definitely don't take a immune suppressor if you are healthy. 
Now in the case of patients, as I had mentioned, hydroxychloroquine happens to be a immune suppressor. Now they are actually reconsidering the regimen of hydroxychloroquine. In the very initial stages of the um, disease, you will have a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine production, but that is the body's native way of fighting against the virus. It is not equivalent to a cytokine storm. There are certain companies who are trying to understand which interleukins are specific for cytokine storms and which are specific for the body's native reaction against this virus. So they are proposing that hydroxychloroquine, which happens to be a immunosuppressant, should not be given in the very first intervention step of SARS-CoV-2. It should be given in later stages when the disease progresses out of control of our own native immune system. We should give our immune system a fighting chance before giving immune suppressants to stop a cytokine storm, which will lead to severe acute respiratory syndrome. Okay, thank you, Srijoni. Thank you for your wonderful answers. I hope we all have got our doubts cleared about these aspects of COVID. Thank you again. It was a pleasure having you. Well, uh, the chat box is flooded with questions, but due to time constraint, we would have to conclude this session now. I would now like to request Dr. Shuchandra Chatterjee, the program coordinator for DBT Star College Scheme, to kindly give the vote of thanks. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Bhushali. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. A very good afternoon to you all, our beloved speaker, valued viewers, technical committee members, worthy faculty, and my beloved students who are virtually present here for the second day of our two days international webinar series, COVID-19 through the eyes of young researchers. You know, the essence of all beautiful art is gratitude and no duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks. And I feel myself really privileged to get this opportunity of delivering vote of thanks in this webinar. On behalf of DBT Star family of Surendranath College, I extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our beloved speaker today, Ms. Srijani Dash, for her beautiful, informative, and eloquent speech. Thank you, Srijani, for your wonderful revelation. May you reach all height of success. I'm thankful to the college authority, our governing body, for their encouragement and our respected principal, Dr. Indru Nilkor, for being the catalyst that stimulated us to do our best. Thanks are due to DBT, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, for granting us this fund. We are really indebted to them. On behalf of DBT Star family, I must express my deepest sense of gratitude to Dr. Nilang Shudas, Head, Department of Molecular Biology, and our bursar too, for steering this webinar from the day one. I'm short of words for his involvement and dedication to make this webinar successful. My sincere love to all our beloved students for the spontaneous presence to make this even, even more colorful. Last but not the least, I am thankful to all the viewers for opting to be here with us. With, without your active participation, this event could not have been possible. Now it's time to conclude, but before that, I must remind you of our upcoming events. Tomorrow at 1 p.m., just before lunchtime, we have an uh, interesting talk by Dr. Shiva Brato Banerjee, a renowned doctor and good orator, who will talk on various COVID testing and modeling perspectives. I uh, hope this webinar organized by Department of Zoology would be highly informative and interesting. And then on July 6 at 11 a.m., there will be another webinar organized by Department of Chemistry. In that international webinar, Dr. S. Pal, uh, a research scientist uh, from Montreal, Canada, 
will uh, help all the students to choose between academics and industry. That would also be a motivating one. So stay tuned. Hope to see you all in those webinars. Till then, goodbye. All stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.